Yeah, hey, how are you doing? Okay, you ready? All right, that's good. Hello and welcome to Coindesk Live. My name is Nick Day. We're going to be talking about Kick today. The SEC filed a lawsuit against Kick in June, alleging Kick violated U.S. securities laws in its 2017 sale of Kin. Uh, Kick filed its response last night, and right now we have Kick CEO Ted Livingston to talk about the case. Ted, how are you? I'm good, Nick. Thanks for having me. I think you're right that is a little uncommon the way we did it but the reason we did it that way is um, we just found the complaint so egregious and so misleading that we felt it was important for the industry to be able to see our point by point response to each paragraph in their complaint so what's next how is this case going to proceed from here I think this is the exciting thing. You know, there's, there's a, a few other lawsuits that are happening in the crypto industry right now. And what's typical is the defendant will try to drag things out, take as much time as possible. But whereas here, we are very confident in our case, and we are also very aware of the need for clarity, both for us and for the industry. And so we're gonna try to push this through as fast as possible. I think we surprised the SEC a bit when we told the judge we wanted a May 2020 court date, less than a year away. Uh, the SEC asked for much later in the year. Uh, they claimed that they didn't have the resources to be able to move that quickly. Uh, but for us, we need this resolved as soon as possible. Um, can you talk a little bit about you know what the immediate impact of the SEC's complaint was? both on the company and on Ken? I think the complaint was tough. Um, you know, we, we knew that we were openly challenging the SEC when we published our Wells response, uh, something that had never been done before in history of the SEC as far as we're concerned. And so we knew this day was coming, but we felt very good that we had been very cautious when we set up the token sale, that we had done our absolute best, that we had created utility, even one that was very hard to do so with the Ethereum network. And so we said, hey, if somebody has to take on the SEC, we're uniquely positioned to do that. Let's go for it. I think what surprised us is just how much the SEC twisted the facts. Um, you know, we've been in litigation before, and you know, that's always been with other companies, and you expect another company to try to twist the facts and make you look bad. But when it comes to the government, we sort of thought they would be you know, above that, that they would be seeking justice, that they're trying to do this on behalf of the people. And so when I first read that complaint, uh, it was painful to read. You know, here we had tried to do everything right. You know, Kin Today is being used by over two and a half million people. It's in over 60 apps, it's working. And yet the SEC paints us as this company that did this out of desperation, that was quick and fast with the, the rules, when they knew they had taken the testimony that we've been working on this since 2011, that we built a whole test economy in 2014. So I think that was really tough for the team. Not that the SEC did that, obviously that was disappointing, but for the industry to believe that, for the industry to believe the SEC's false narrative uh, has been a painful experience for us for sure. So um, I noticed parts of the response addressed um, comments that you felt had been taken out of context by the SEC in this initial complaint. Can you speak to um, you know, what the, maybe a bit about the discovery process and why you think the comments were taken out of a context when the SEC, I assume, knew full well that you would be able to file the full comments or context in the response and in exhi uh, exhibitions? Yeah, so this is another thing that was new to us. 
typically when you have a company versus company litigation, one company files a lawsuit, the other files its response, and then you go into discovery. Whereas here with the SEC, they got to do the discovery all ahead of time. Uh, so they collected over 50,000 emails. They took almost 200 hours of live testimony taped with myself and many others in Washington. And so they had literally like over 100,000 quotes to choose from. And so for them to take only a handful of those, and even the handful they did take, for them to cut out the context in a way that totally changed the meaning, to me, it actually gave me confidence in the case. You know, we already felt really good about it, but when we saw the SEC resorting to these desperate tactics to just try to make us look bad, it was sort of like, wow, they must also think they don't even have a good case. Because if they did, it'd be very simple. You already have all the discovery. You have all the emails. Why don't you just show the facts and let the facts speak for themselves? Why do you have to twist the facts in an irrelevant way, irrelevant to whether it's a securities offering or not, simply to make us look bad? We thought you would be above that. Discussing with the SEC or continued conversations with the SEC, while working on the response or has it just is it now strictly you're going to speak and meet in court um it's a good question i'm not sure the conversations that have continued between our lawyers and the sec's lawyers i know for example uh, our lawyers and their lawyers met with the judge something like two weeks ago but in terms of like having settlement discussions um those haven't happened since the lawsuit was filed. And, you know, I've seen a number of people speculate on why wouldn't they just take a settlement? Why wouldn't they just take a settlement? And if there was a good settlement, a win-win settlement, we would have taken it. Why? Because we understand the SEC is in a tough position. This is an industry full of scammers and fraudsters. And if we could help them create some boundaries around that, give them a tool to go after those scams, we would have been happy to do so. But the thing we needed in return is explicit acknowledgement that Kin today and going forward is not a security. Because if Kin is a security, it becomes unusable. You know, every time I want to buy a token, I have to go to my broker dealer. That's not going to work. There's nowhere in the in the United States that I can buy a security token as a general member of the public today. And so this is why, you know, we're super excited about the progress Blockstack and you now and props have made with a Reg A plus filing. But what a Reg A plus is, is you're saying you're a security. And when I ask people involved with these projects, like, that's great, you can do the fundraising component, but how will people actually buy the token to use it? They say to me, you know, I don't know, that's an unsolved problem. We're hoping that by the time we get there, the industry will figure it out. And to me, that's, uh, you know, we've seen with the SEC almost no guidance, two irrelevant no action letters. That's a risky bet. So kind of jumping on the settlement aspect here, uh, what would a win-win settlement look like to you? The thing we needed is that kin today and going forward is not a security. Everything else for us was negotiable. We feel incredibly confident that Kin sold in 2017 was not a security. But if we could find a win for the SEC and a win for us, that allowed us each to move forward and allowed the industry to move forward, allowed the millions of people who are using Kin today on chain in control of their own keys to continue to use it, we would have taken that. But I think this is just the unique position Kin is in. Kin is one of the only cryptocurrencies in the world being used actively by millions of consumers in dozens of apps. You know, Top 10 Project told us, you guys are the only guys so far who have cracked the consumer adoption problem. And so for other projects, this may not be a challenge yet. People may not want to buy it to use it yet. But for Kin, it's a real need that we have right now. And so if the SEC were to say, you know what? Kin today is sufficiently decentralized. We will say that on the record that it is not a security today and going forward. We would be very happy to work with them 
to find what is a, an equal win for them in 2017. But if they can't do that and, and they were not prepared to, then we have to go to court. Um, do you have a sense of, you know, how to judge my lean in terms of timeline? We're going to push to move this case as fast as we can. Um, with Judge a couple weeks ago, we proposed a May 2020 trial date, uh, whereas the SEC proposed something much later in the year. And what the judge said is they weren't, he wasn't willing yet to set a trial date, but there's a bunch of dates that lead up to a proposed trial date. It's a full schedule. And so what the judge said is, but what I will do is I'm going to go with Kick's recommendation for when that first step should be, which is when discovery should be finished by, which is November of this year. So it seems the judge agrees with us that this case is doing real damage to us and the industry. And so it's important that we move this case through as quickly as possible. And so that's why he went with Kick's timetable. Um, yeah, I think that's all the questions I have. Um, thank you for taking the time. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. When that's live, we'll be back.
Hey, welcome back to Coindesk Live. My name is Nick. We're joined now by Joshua Ashley Clayman, head of fintech, excuse me, the US head of fintech and head of blockchain and digital assets at Linklater's LLP. How are you? I'm great, Nick. How are you? I'm good. good. Thanks for stopping by today. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So um, you've read the response. It's 131 pages. What do you make of it? So before I answer, I have to give my yeah. normal disclaimers, all of them, which are, which are this is not legal or investment advice. Um, nothing that I say has any bearing on what my firm may think or on what any of our clients' views may be or any other person in the world, actually. And then most importantly for this, I'm not a litigator, as you know, and so I'm, I'm not somebody who goes to court and uh, deals with these matters on a, a normal basis or at all, although I have many colleagues who do. So please bear that in mind when you're listening to my response. So with that out of the way, what do I make of it? Well, I thought it was a, an exciting read, um, just to start that way. It definitely was not what I typically have seen in the limited number of, of answers that I've read. Um, it went into great detail and basically recited the, the complaint um, back into, into the answer itself. I thought it was very interesting, um, the tactic that they're taking. Uh, I guess stepping back for a second, if we think about some of what was said even before the complaint was filed, when the crypto defense fund was first being talked about, I mean, there has been from the beginning, it seems, a, an appetite to really be, be bringing in the community and the world into this. So really talking about facts in a very detailed manner, um, even in the, um, in the beginning of the answer, you know, Kick, its lawyers, right, said, well, the SEC has, you know, had its, I think they said something, its news cycle, a good news cycle. So these are, you know, these are kind of, strong words and I think that's part of of what we're seeing in the answer as well is really point counterpoint you know two people right. or two parties with very strong positions either way and that it seems to me that based on the filings um, and based on the answer that a lot of this case is not just going to be tried in the court but also in public opinion right so You've kind of touched on this, but the response was formatted in a paragraph by paragraph rebuttal. Um, what are your thoughts on that particular strategy? Well, again, I'm not a litigator and I have not um, exhaustively been reading answers for my whole career. But I will say, I haven't typically seen that. And often, I think, in answers, there's a very short answer. Um, short responses that basically deny something or admit in part certain things. I have not typically seen the um, the point by point recounting, but again, I think it's sort of the fact that you could sit there and read the answer and have have the the points from the complaint right there. Um, you know, it made a really interesting read, and I think that that while. Let me step back for a second. I think that for Kick and for the position that they're trying to advocate or present, that's important for them, right? That when we read it, if what Kick is trying to say is these facts were mischaracterized, the fact that they showed what was said and then what they allege, or what was alleged to be said, and then the additional, for example, quotes that may or may not have gone alongside what was initially posed. I think that was done to show what they've been saying, um, not just in the beginning of the answer, but also after the complaint was filed, which is that, you know, assuming this comes down to facts, in many cases, the right. facts are not necessarily in their view as was presented in the complaint. Right. So. Um, and so kind of touching on this whole court of public opinion aspect, um, I've seen many people say that the response was kind of aggressive, right? It was uh, designed to be, you know, kind of 
incendiary might not be the right word, but it was designed to draw attention. Um, do you feel that it is an aggressive strategy that Kick has pursued? So again, I, I'm not in the practice of counseling people on what would be a, a good strategy, an aggressive strategy, a strong strategy. What I will say is it seems consistent with what they've done in the past with the Crypto Defense Fund, with the press releases that I believe came out um, and the statements that came out after the complaint was filed. Um, so I, I do think that they have been signaling all along that they, they are not interested in, in going down without a fight, if at all. Um, I think also, again, the, the narrative position, this is a going concern, right? They're doing business now. This isn't a company that's out of business. So I think uh, in part, they may be trying to say, you know, don't count us out um, right. and, you know, continue to use our services, continue to build this ecosystem. Um, but again, I think clearly uh, the SEC brought this case and they feel strongly about the case from their perspective. So I think these are two, um, are two parties who are both very, uh, have very strong views about what happened and how it should proceed. Okay. And then um, I guess kind of a last question. Uh, any thoughts on the broader ecosystem impact that this case might have, um, not necessarily on Kick or Ken, but just on you know, crypto space in general? Well, I think what's interesting is that in the time since the, the complaint was filed, we've seen more and more companies, um, both those that have announced and also, who knows, maybe those that have not, that have been thinking more along the lines of using crypto or developing some sort of digital asset to be used as payment or things like that, which is interesting because that's kind of what Kin was talking about in its well submission. So in the answer, in fact, in several places, Kick talks about, well, Facebook and others, you know, is pointing the, the, right. pointing the finger a little, saying, well, we, I, I think in one place, the answer says something like, and this is not a quote, right? Says something like, well, we could have sold our data, but we didn't, right? And in another place, they were saying, well, our, our competitors and many in the space have done this, including, I believe they mentioned, um, well, one of them was Facebook. I'm not going to go through the rest of them. But interestingly, obviously, as was pointed out in Catherine Wu's amazing annotated <laughs> markup, um, obviously, there had been no ICO or TDE, as it was described in the answer um, by Facebook. But, but I, do, um, I do think the fact that we were beginning to see larger names in the space um, coming out and more attention from legislators and regulators, I just think it's, it's an interesting time. It's an interesting time to be making the argument that something is um, a virtual currency. Awesome. Was there anything else that really kind of stood out to you? I think in the affirmative defenses, um, there was one that related to, I believe, vagueness and whether, whether folks had appropriate notice of whether the, you know, whether the Howey test would apply. Right. Um, I think it's, it will be interesting to see how that turns out. I mean, if I think about, and I believe it's actually in another court, although maybe it's not, but the Diamond Recoin case, right? You know, there was in at least one sort of, um, one thing I read, the court had said, actually you do have cons constitutionally sufficient notice that it applied. Look, there was the Dow guidance, the SEC has been giving guidance and things like that. And I believe that the Recoin Diamond may have been launched somewhere around like September of 2017. So I think it's going to be interesting. One of the things in the answer that certainly um, stood out to me in this section was that they, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, were pulling from things that were quoted by, for example, Commissioner Peirce and others. 
um, that, that showed some of the different views about when and how things should apply. So I think, um, again, I'm not a litigator. I can't even presume to, to know um, or, and would never presume to advise folks on this, but, but I do think that this was a compelling read, much as the complaint was a compelling read and um, that's all I'll say. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah, no, thank you for your time. Oh, um, my pleasure. We will be back, Coindesk Live will be back. Right.
Hello and welcome back to Coindesk Live. For those of you just joining us, my name is Nick. And we're now joined by Rebecca Reddig, a partner and a member of the FinTech and blockchain practice at Fisher Broil. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us. Um, so I have a number of questions about the filing, but I guess just to start with, um, what are your broad thoughts on the response? Um, my thought is that this is Kick's have your cake and eat it too kind of moment. Um, when you file an answer traditionally in litigation, it's pretty bare bones. You simply admit or deny the allegations and you don't really get to tell your story. If you want to tell your story, you frequently file what's called a motion to dismiss, which lets you lay out the facts that you think rebut the claims in full. And even if you think you have maybe just a fighting chance but not a great chance of winning, you'll still file it because sometimes you want to frame your case for the court, for the judge, um, and to give your view of the case as it moves forward. Um, an answer usually doesn't give you a chance to do that, and Kick definitely took their chance to tell their story. It's a pretty unconventional answer as far as litigation goes, but it definitely tells their side of the story. It puts quotes in context very frequently, and um, I think it let them um, give some meat to their statements that they made when the complaint was filed that this doesn't you know, reflect the full facts and that the complaint didn't tell the full story. So this is their side of the story and they're laying out sort of a playbook and a roadmap for as they go forward in the case. Right, so speaking of the motion to dismiss, they didn't file one. Um, could they have and would it have been more beneficial to do so versus this strategy or? So there are a number of different strategies you can take. Nothing I say here necessarily is legal advice, but um, they, they could have filed a motion to dismiss, as I said, to either frame the case or if they thought that there was a, that the SEC hadn't pled the claim sufficiently. So a motion to dismiss really says that the complaint as it stands doesn't state a claim under the law. It's not about the facts or anything that's going to come out in discovery. The advantage of filing an answer here is that it will move the case much more quickly than a motion to dismiss because when you file a motion to dismiss you have the motion then a lengthy point of time to for the sec to file their opposition and then a time to file a reply and then extra time for the for, for the court to consider the motion and make a ruling here they filed their answer they're not after the races on discovery and they're going to get to a trial much more quickly and for you know as they also said at the time the complaint was filed they really want to make new law um, district courts don't make new law appellate courts, the Second Circuit, the Supreme Court um, really makes new law and this will allow them to get to judgment in the district court much more quickly. So I think it probably serves their purposes in that regard. Gotcha. So looking at the specifics of the case itself, what precedents might the SEC be looking to here? I mean, I think the SEC is going to, as they've been doing all along, rely on Howie. Their playbook is clear and their position has been clear all along. So, and when I say Howie, don't just mean the case from 1947. There are, are tons of cases, um, both in the Supreme Court that have interpreted Howie as well at, as at the circuit court and district court levels for all sorts of novel instruments, financial or otherwise, um, in determining whether they're securities or not. And the SEC will probably be relying on those cases that what they're called Howie and its progeny. Right. So then on the other side of that, what might Kick be looking to? So Kick gives some indications, not as, uh, they gave indications in their Wells notice of certain specific cases they're going to be looking at, either to argue that um, Kin isn't a security. Um, but I think they'll, they've also made some indications in their answer where they said the concept of decentralization is totally made up out of whole cloth and doesn't belong in the Howey analysis. And so that gives us an indication of certain types of arguments they're going to make. Um, and so I think they've laid out some of the roadmap of the types of arguments they're going to be making, even if they don't lay out the specific precedent in cases they're going to rely on. Right. Um, so just kind of getting really into the weeds here, so there was a line about jurisdiction. Um, what's the significance of that? So there are a couple lines about jurisdiction. There is an affirmative defense at the very, very end that just says the SEC doesn't have jurisdiction to prosecute this case. And then there was also up in paragraph 27, um, a line about jurisdiction where the SEC had said, uh, there's jurisdiction in this federal court because among other things in the terms of service, Kick asserted that any dispute arising under the, T uh, under the TOS between Kick and a consumer will have to be tried in the United States and in particular in Delaware court. And 
Kick's response to that is, well, the SEC isn't a party to our terms of service. Um, and I don't think the SEC was actually trying to make that point. I think the point of what the SEC was trying to say in paragraph 27 of the complaint was, you've clearly availed yourself of jurisdiction in the United States. You, Kick, have said you want to use the US courts, so you obviously believe there is jurisdiction here because you've been conducting activities in the United States. Right. Um, so in terms of um, getting to, you know, as you said, they're trying to move quickly. Um, they called for, I believe, a jury trial. What might a judge or a jury be looking at when you know this case comes before them? So I thought about that actually a lot as I was reading the complaint because what you do a lot during trial is someone may read a select portion of a quote to a witness or um, a witness may say a very select part of a quote that they recall and then you on cross-examination will take the full document and show it to the jury and put it in context um, and I think a lot of what they were doing uh, in their complaint was a lot of what you do at trial which is make your case the best you can with the evidence that there is and then the other side tries to take both the available evidence the same evidence you used um, and testimony from people to show motive intent although this is not really a, a claim that has a motive piece to it section 5 of the Securities Act isn't a motive type of claim um, but I think from reading the complaint and um, the SEC's complaint and from reading the answer it's clear that everyone is going to I think in some way try to use motive to show um, Kick's frame of mind as they were going into uh, the sale of Kin. Right. So what else really kind of stood out to you when you were reading this? Uh, what really stood out to me while I was reading it is that there is really a, sort of a playbook in here. So there were certain types of arguments that they made that other ICOs um, aren't relevant. So that indicated to me that, that um, Kick and its lawyers will make a motion in limine, to, what's so a motion to exclude certain types of evidence going into trial. And I think that they're going to try to exclude evidence as they get closer to trial um, of any other ICOs, what they mean, what the SEC said about them. Um, they may also try to exclude the Dow report, although that, that may be hard. And they also may want to use that to distinguish their own token sale from, from the Dow. Um, so that really stood out to me. Um, and that they really uh, tried to use everything, including what I thought was interesting, was different pieces of the SEC's investigation itself. So they made the point that the SEC investigated the Kin Foundation and then didn't make a claim. That's highly unusual that they would sort of use the SEC's investigation against them. Um, and that they would even talk about various testimony of witnesses during the SEC's investigation in their answer. So that was highly unusual, but really interesting. And, um, you know, I think really tried to make their point. The other thing is they've now told their side of the story. They've had the last word. The SEC doesn't respond to an answer, either formally or informally. And now we go into discovery. And the next time we'll hear from anybody is during motion practice, which is probably at the summary judgment stage. Gotcha. So. Um, what are some things you think we should look out for as this continues? So the affirmative defenses that Kik asserted are really um, legal affirmative defenses and likely will have to be decided by the judge and not go in front of a jury. So we'll have the chance to hear and see probably some of the judge's thoughts. Judge Hellerstein is a very seasoned judge. He's been on the bench a long time. He's seen a lot of big cases. So he's used to sort of a high pressure, high stakes um, case. And um, so we'll have the opportunity to hear from him. And if we don't get, you know, if neither side gets summary judgment, then we will go to a jury trial. Um, and it'll be very interesting because I think public sentiment around crypto and blockchain is pretty precarious right now, given everything going on in the space and everything that's been going on in Congress of late. And I think um, picking a jury will be a really interesting and maybe, um, you know, a very high, it's always a high stakes experience to pick a jury, but particularly here in terms of how familiar are people with crypto, do, you know, do they know about Libra? Will that play into jury selection? Um, what do they think about it? Just unclear, you know, do they know about Silk Road from back in the day? So uh, sort of the history of crypto, both past and present, may come out during jury selection. So following up on that, do you think that if we do get to a jury trial and 
you know, random group of, I guess, 12 to 14 people. Uh, will there be any kind of educational component to either side? Will they have to explain, well, this is the, here, here are the specific attributes of kin versus Bitcoin versus Libra versus whatever popular coin you might have heard of? So I don't think you want to get into, uh, as they said, I think they'll try to exclude a lot of these other types of cryptocurrencies. Um, there's always an educational element anytime you try a case, but you don't, you, you fold it into the story you're telling, and then each side presents their case, there may be some rebuttal, and then the judge does what's called jury instructions, where he reads jury instructions that the parties have agreed upon based on the law to the jury to explain the elements of a claim and then the jury is tasked with going back into the jury room, taking the facts and the evidence that have been presented by both sides and applying the law as presented by the jury instructions to determine whether you know, the SEC has made out their claim or whether Kit gets off. Awesome. So um, any closing thoughts uh, before we wrap up? No, I, I think what is interesting is that you have two very highly motivated parties in this case who um, really are going to take their positions um, all the way. Um, given the tenor of the answer, it doesn't seem like we're going to see a settlement, um, at least anytime soon. And um, for those who have sort of been asking for clarity in some way, shape, or form, and for those of us litigators who have been sort of saying for a long time, clarity comes from the courts, um, this is a moment. Whether, you know, every case is fact-specific, any determination will be applied to the facts of this case, so it won't necessarily have an application to Libra by itself, but it will be the first case that really goes through all the way to a jury, and I think it will give us insight along the way as we continue to build out the legal and regulatory landscape around crypto. Awesome. Um, thank you for joining us. Thanks uh, again for having me. Thanks for having you. Uh, Coindesk Live will be back soon.
Welcome back to Coindesk Live. My name is Nick Day, and we are now joined by Nelson Rosario of Smolensky Rosario Law. Nelson, how are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me, Nick. It's a pleasure to talk with you today, uh, and I'm uh, you know, excited to be here. Beer. What are your thoughts overall? Yeah, so this is a... Um, the response from Keek is lengthy, to say the least. Uh, they went through and addressed every single point, paragraph by paragraph, that the SEC originally brought in the complaint. And there's a saying in the law, if the law is against you, you pound the facts. If the facts are against you, you pound the law. And if the law and the facts are against you, you pound the table and yell like hell. I don't think this is a situation where Keek needs to be pounding the table. Uh, but based on their response and some of the points that they kind of emphasize, it seems like they feel like the facts are in their favor. And I think that was borne out in how they addressed the complaint. So, you know, we're, we're looking at two very uh, motivated and sophisticated parties uh, that are involved here. And as far as any of us can tell, I would say, uh, Keek is definitely interested in having this fight, which is in line with what they've been saying publicly and everything else. So speaking to some of the specific issues in the complaint, Kick uh, said that um, many statements were taken out of context and then they provided uh, what they said was the full context. What are your thoughts on uh, both, you know, did the SEC actually cherry pick specific com uh, comments to make Kick look bad? And then also the, you know, the kick strategy and the response. Yeah, well, taking a step back a little, um, in some ways this is kind of what litigation is about, right? You are, both parties are operating under the same set of facts and you want to emphasize particular facts and situations and kind of everything else in a manner that makes, puts your argument in the best light. Conversely, if you're, you know, Keek in this situation, it, it makes perfect sense that you would say, oh, no, 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 this, these facts were taken out of context and, you know, the SEC has omitted, you know, really relevant material either before a quote or after a quote as to whether, uh, you know, that adds additional color to, um, you know, what is actually going on. So it, it's not surprising, and you know, we see this time after time in these crypto-related lawsuits that the initial complaint is kind of a parade of horribles, right? And it, you read it and you're like, wow, that sounds really bad. And then you get an answer and you get kind of the other side of the story. Um, I do think that it's a bit interesting and somewhat of a gamble for uh, Keek to take as strong of a position on uh, the SEC's characterization of the facts. Uh, and I say that because, you know, they're filing this uh, with a judge and, you know, they're somewhat insinuating that the SEC was not being completely honest with the way that they've presented this case. And, you know, I'm sure that was a uh, well thought out strategy. They're represented by, you know, good counsel. There's a very, again, very sophisticated players, but you know, that's pretty aggressive. The tone uh, of the, of the answer is kind of basically saying that the SEC uh, didn't make this up, but you know, the, the way that they presented it is just so far divorced from the truth of the matter that um, you know, this is just not right. And you know, on the one hand, that is zealous advocacy for their client, you know, for Keith, that's what you want your attorney to do for you. But, you know, the judge is going to give some deference to the Securities Exchange Commission. It's just kind of, you know, it's not like these are two private parties, right? You know, on one side, you have the government, on the other side, you have a private company. So I did find it interesting that uh, it was as aggressive as it was. So kind of just expanding that out into the overall strategy. Um, what are your thoughts on how Kick's been playing this since you know day one when they first uh, announced that they were filing or publishing their Wells uh, submission and response? Yeah. So I, I had a little difficulty hearing you there, but I, I think you're asking, you know, kind of what is their their overall strategy in in 
how they have answered this. And, um, you know, going back to what I said initially, you know, I think they think the facts are very much in their favor. And so they're trying to add as much additional color to those facts to put their case in the best light to, you know, build it that they don't, they aren't subject to the SEC's regulation here and this case should be thrown out. I do think it's interesting, given the parties involved here, uh, the tone of all of this. And what I mean is that, you know, Keek is a, an established company. It has, uh, you know, an actual user base, you know, right there that's distinguishing from a lot of the blockchain projects that we've seen that tried to raise funds via ICOs and other matters, right? And so, uh, in particular, we've seen very prominent VC firms go to bat for Keek. You know, Andreessen Horowitz, Union Square Ventures, they've made public statements, you know, about this particular case. There's a whole defend crypto, uh, you know, kind of, I don't know if you would call it a move, movement, but website, you know, this attempt to try and make Keek the, uh, you know, poster boy of, of innovation and moving the industry forward. And so given the amount of uh, publicity this has drawn and kind of the the roadshow that the CEO has taken and saying that the SEC is is holding the industry back and you know the sentiment amongst certain VC firms that that is the case that uh, innovation is being held back in this country and you know they're making this a very public case uh, I wonder if there's kind of some more long-term play uh, at hand here where Keek and their backers and everybody else are not necessarily just talking to the judge and they're not necessarily just talking about this particular case, but they're speaking to Congress, for example. You know, we've seen a lot of, uh, you know, for lack of a better phrase, blockchain woke legislation being introduced and passed around the country. I think almost 40 states in the past two years have introduced some type of legislation to try and encourage innovation in the community and make things friendlier. And I wonder if the way that Keek has kind of postured in this case is just kind of part of that particular zeitgeist of uh, certain people that are trying to develop in this space are convinced that new legislation is needed and, you know, they need to take a more aggressive tone with the SEC. And in fact, you know, it was, I think, in April of 2018 where uh, Andreessen Horowitz, I'm not sure Union Square, Square Ventures, but a couple of other VC firms and lawyers, you know, actually met with the SEC in private and tried to lobby them uh, that, you know, particular token offerings, I think the focus there was with uh, Ether and, you know, Ethereum, uh, were not securities offerings and, you know, make their case that this is a brand new industry, we shouldn't be hamstringing it, so let's kind of, you know, try and work together and find a path forward. Um, Kick has said in the past, and I think Ted Livingston, uh, Kick CEO, said earlier today even, that they're hoping the case will result in uh, some kind of new law or precedent. Um, what do you feel or what do you think of the chances or the broader impact that this case might have on the crypto ecosystem as a whole? You, you know, that's hard to say. And that's a long way off. If this actually goes to trial, it wouldn't be until probably at the end of last year. In fact, I think the SEC had asked um, that that would be kind of the, the timeline. Uh, and I'm not sure how impactful it could actually be, given that um, in many ways the, the, the Kin token offering was very similar to other ICO offerings. And there aren't like a lot of distinguishing factors um, between this, I would, you know, in my opinion, as compared to other offerings. So, you know, if they thought that the law was really um, just completely irrelevant, which they somewhat make that argument in the response, it, it doesn't seem like this is necessarily a good vehicle to try and deliver some sort of new thing. Now, I will say, again, you know, the, the Kin token was, the point was introduced into this uh, key e ecosystem with hundreds of thousands of users. And so it is distinguishable. And, you know, I think that's a colorable argument that, no, this is intended to be a utility token. 
And you know, they mention in the answer, we didn't have any guidance on utility tokens. So we made a best effort. We tried to you know, cross all of our T's, dot all of our I's. But uh, you know, regulation was not forthcoming in our opinion. And we, didn't, we did the best that we could. And we shouldn't necessarily be punished uh, retroactively because of that. But the idea that this is, um, you know, could be broadly impactful, it, it's not super compelling to me, but they're obviously uh, uh, kind of very connected, powerful interests that feel like, no, this is uh, an excellent vehicle to try and get some precedent on, uh, on the books that we can use to move the industry forward. But again, this is not, you know, yeah, Bitcoin is not being come after, Ethereum is not being come after, Grin, you know, a, a lot of these other projects that are, I would say are closer to kind of the decentralization ethos that ostensibly underlies the industry and kind of its genesis. Uh, this is a much uh, more corporate attempt to try and build a decentralized network. So guess just kind of very broadly, um, are there any predictions that you're willing to share? Anything you think we should definitely be looking out for? Any predictions of things we should definitely be looking out for with respect to this case? You know, I think uh, for me, the most interesting angle is kind of that uh, the publicity aspect of this. Okay, so if we see additional comments from uh, Ted Livingston, if we see, you know, Andreessen Horowitz, Union Square Ventures, you know, those kind of out there, if there's more movement in the defend crypto front, uh, at the moment, you know, with the, the response to the complaint, uh, there isn't going to be a lot of uh, action for a while in this case, you know, proceed to discovery, they'll go to motion practice, and so on. But I think that kind of how the Keat story fits into the broader narrative of innovation in the crypto space and kind of what this all means and, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, they've repeatedly mentioned, you know, how much money they've had to spend on lawyers just to try and get some sort of clarity, which, you know, that's a very valid concern on their part. I think those narrative aspects and what it kind of means for crypto is, is much more interesting to watch and kind of... Uh, see how the story continues to develop, right? Any closing thoughts uh, you might have before we wrap up? Uh, no, nothing in particular. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I guess if nothing else, it, it would be interesting to see this actually go all the way to trial because, uh, you know, once you have get a jury selected and you have kind of uh, 12 of your peers out there uh, trying to make a determination as to what is going on. And then you throw in the complexity that this is a cryptocurrency and a budding industry and, you know, just kind of the other <laughs> madness surrounding uh, this space with Twitter and YouTube and conferences. And some of the evidence is just kind of um, interesting, I guess, you know, and statements made and whatnot, and then trying to see the two sides uh, present their story and compel, you know, uh, 12 people that very likely, um, um, up until the point they're selected for that jury, had almost no interest in crypto, uh, would be interesting to watch kind of play out. Awesome. Well, thank you for your time, and thanks for joining us today. Pleasure, and uh, hopefully we we'll talk again soon. Take care. You too. This is it for CoinDesk Live and uh, our breakdown of Kix 2017 token sale and the SEC complaint and response to it. Um, see you next time on CoinDesk Live.